We're going to be in First Thessalonians again, chapter 1, as we make our way through this, this book. Uh, if you want to turn there, whatever that looks like on an app, a Bible, uh, whatever, whatever you use. Uh, you can also, we also have a PowerPoint I'll have for you as well. Uh, as I said in the, in the first service, I'm going to, uh, going to make a statement here. Um, I, I don't think it's a bad statement. I think it's a very true statement. I'm going to start out and just say it for what it's worth, and then we're going to kind of go with that and see where the Lord takes us today as we uh, dive into what God's put in my heart for this, these uh, chapters, verses 4 through 10 and 1 Thessalonians of chapter 1. And here it is. I, I believe, truly believe in all my heart, unless you've been asleep uh, for a long, long time, I believe we can all agree that the world is changing at an alarming rate. It's changing at an alarming rate. Everything from... Politics, social issues, and economics. We live in a much different world than we did just five years ago. Not, not to mention 10, 20. But just five years ago, think of how much things have changed. The capacity to affect our character, development, or behavior is just a click away. It's just a click away. And that, by the way, is, is the definition of the word influence, the capacity to affect our character, development, or behavior, to be influenced. Of course, when I say we are just a click away, I mean we have, we have a, the television, right? Just the remote, just a click away, click, click. How many of you remember the days when there weren't any remotes? And if you were the youngest in the house, you were the remote, Just to click away. We have television. We have entertainment platforms like Netflix. And what are, how many remember going to the store to get your video you're going to watch for the night? I remember going to the store when the VHS was out and we couldn't afford a VHS. You had to rent the VHS player and the video. How many remember that? Of course, that was more than five years ago, but things are changing. Oh, how many even know what a VHS player is? <laughs> how about an out, an eight track? So when I say we're just a click away, I mean we have the television, entertainment platforms like Netflix and all those, and who can forget all the social media platforms? And it's with this great influence, the capacity to affect our character, development, or behavior, it's with this great influence through these platforms, we have the host of people who are influencing the world more, more than ever, right, with these platforms. I want you to look at the top 10 influencers on social media by uh, IZEA, I-Z-E-E-A. It's a marketing company. And this was taken from February 21st of 2020. So it's a little old and I'm sure it's changed a little bit, but you're going to get my point. Here's the top 10 influencers on social media at that time. Number one, Christina Ronaldo, Christino. And, and like I said in the first service, I don't care if I get these names right or not. After today, I will never see them again. Okay? Okay. He's a Portuguese soccer player. So when, I, when we talk about the, so, uh, the total number of followers they have, we're going to be looking at all of them they have on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So these are all combined. So he has, he's number one out of the top 10 at this date. He had 406.6 million followers. 406.6 people he can influence with the statement, whatever. 406 million. That's a couple. Number two, everybody probably knows Justin Bieber. He's a Canadian pop singer and actor. I'll, the only reason I'll accept that is because he's supposed to be a born-again believer now, so yes. <laughs> I 
If it wasn't for that, you'd be in trouble, Daniel. <laughs> 362.7 million followers. People that he influences. Number three, Taylor Swift. One of the most popular, or excuse me, a country singer, songwriter, uh, turned pop queen, 316.8 million. Ari Arena Granada, I don't care, is one of the most popular, one of the most popular pop singers in the world. Told you how much pop music I listen to. 316.7 million followers. Number five, Selena Gomez. She's a popular actress and singer. 316 million. Number six, Kate Perry or Katy Perry, American singer and songwriter. 297 million people she can influence by writing one little thing on a post. Kim Kardashian West is number seven. Businesswoman, model, social media uh, um, mogul, 252 million. Beyonce is number eight, award-winning singer, songwriter, music producer, actress, 233.4 million. Number nine, I'll butcher his name all day long, Felix Kilberg. He's a Swedish, a Swedish social media influencer who specializes in gaming and videos. 227.7 million people that he influenced because he plays a game. <laughs> and then number 10, Kylie Jenner, half-sister of Kim Kardashian. Of course, she became popular through that family reality TV show. Uh, 221 million people. The point that I want to make, what's the definition of an influencer? The capacity to affect our character, development, or behavior to influence people. They have that many people that are following them. Do you think they're influencing anybody? Influence people. It's obvious to see that we have a lot of opportunities due to social media to be influenced by people, by people, people from all walks of life. Those are just the top 10. Most of those are musical or, or whatever, or gamers. Those are the top 10. And, and obviously there's, there's many, many others, people from all walks of life, be it businessmen, politicians, athletes, musicians, movie stars, motivational speakers, and pastors. Influence. Who you decide to follow may begin to influence your character, which in turn results in you imitating them. Okay? Like it or not, they become, they can become your role model. Your role model generally reflects your interest in life. There is nothing wrong with aspiring to follow the examples of another person, right? When I became a born-again believer, uh, I think almost 30 years ago now, I had a role model, I had a mentor, I had somebody that, that I looked up to uh, because of his walk with Jesus, that, that was my pastor, one of my best friends to this day, still talk a lot. I still admire him for, for the way he has followed Jesus his whole life. I would call him a role model. But you and I, as born-again disciples of Jesus, need to make sure that who we decide to make our role model to influence us, to follow, has, they have to have a priority to imitate Jesus first in their life. If you're a born-again disciple of Jesus, they have to have a priority to make Jesus first in their life. Hopefully that is where you begin each and every day as you get up yourself, you get up and say, I'm going to imitate Jesus today. That's where you start, right? Hopefully that's where you start. 
You see, I, I really truly have a hard, hard time understanding how a born-again disciple of Jesus can have a role model that is not grounded in Jesus. I don't get it. Garbage in, garbage out, people. Why? Because a good role model shows what can be done. A good role model gives direction for what should be done. And a good role model inspires others to live a life that puts others first. And that is what we see this morning. We're going to see this morning as we continue through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Let's pray and we'll turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. Father, still our hearts. Again, I lift my brother up to you. It's heavy on my heart right now as I speak. God, we just lift John up to you again. Pray for your divine. Um, just interact, Lord. We just pray that you'd still our hearts and minds. Help us to receive from you. May the Holy Spirit move mightily in this place as we look at the living, breathing word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. First Thessalonians. Chapter 1, starting in verse 4. For we know, brothers, for we know, comma, brothers, again, referring to all of us as we've seen the last few weeks, that we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are the family. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. He has chosen you. He has chosen you. He has chosen you. You see, God chooses everybody. The Bible says he wishes that none would perish. So that means he chooses you. The issue is, is do you choose him? Okay, that's the issue. God chooses us. He chooses everybody. Verse 5, because our gospel, Paul is writing this to the Thessalonians to encourage them He says, because our gospel, the gospel is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's reminding them of this this gospel, uh, of big G God. He's reminding them of this gospel. There's other little G gospels all around Thessalonian. We saw that last week, right? But he's reminding them because of our gospel came to you not simply with words. All the little G gods are nothing but words. It did not simply come with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. That's what a living God does. That is the power of God, a living God. They had a lot of little G gods, as we've seen. They had idols. They had idols for everything. They had a God of war, of love, a God of earth, a God of sea, a God of pleasure, a God of anger. A God of heaven, a God of hell. They had all these little G gods that had no power. And Paul's reminding them, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators. You became imitators of us. Speaking Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and most importantly, of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, they're being persecuted for their belief in this in this city we looked at that last week you welcome the message with the joy given by the holy spirit and so you became a model you became a role model you became an influencer to all the believers in macedonia and achaia the lord's message rang out from you not only in macedonia and achaia your faith in god has become known everywhere what a model it is Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The coming wrath. The coming wrath. What is the coming wrath? It's God's judgment on sin and, and those who choose not to believe. There is a wrath coming. The Bible's very clear. It's not for believers. Amen? 
So Paul is applauding this young church for their example. He said, you became imitators of us and the Lord in spite of severe suffering. Paul mentions several things in these verses that show why this young church is a good example to us today. A church worthy of imitating. They're worthy of imitating because they're imitating Christ ultimately. Okay? Now, I want you to imagine with me, if you, if you would, that this church in Thessalonica, this church has a Facebook page. They have a social media page. There's nothing new under the sun, right? They have one. It's a long time ago. They don't even have a computer yet, but they have a Facebook page. We can turn to it for inspiration as we journey along our faith. So we're going to turn to their page today. Let's turn there and see their good example, a church worth imitating, as Paul mentions from these verses. There's their page. Wow, look at that. They have 777 people like this page. Seven is God's perfect number. Does that make sense? 1,007 people follow them, and they have three check-ins, probably Paul, Timothy, and Silas checking in. And their first post, look at they have all sevens on their phone number. Their address is 777 The Way Street. <laughs> it's a happening place. They even have a web page. The Thessalonian Church on Messenger, excuse me, the Thessalonian Church.com. Somebody should check that out. And look at their first event. They're having a revival service, Paul and Timothy and Silas. They're on their way to do a revival service. That's what happened in church, wouldn't you think? Let's scroll down and see what their next event is. Oh, they're having family camp. <laughs> look at that. It even says, go to the information booth for more details. Whoever would have thunk that? Wow, they must be copying us or something. <laughs> Happened in church. In all seriousness, seriousness though, I, I want us to see, see what else we can see that would lead us to believe this church is a good example. We're going to look at five things this morning, quick as possible. <laughs> Number one, they became imitators. As I've mentioned, they became imitators of the disciples, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and most importantly, Jesus. Their social media pages were linked to what these disciples were teaching and following themselves. This church was listening more at this time, okay, being taught by, by uh, oral by the first hand, by oral experience. They didn't have the New Testament. It wasn't written yet. They didn't have all these things. So they're being taught by first hand experiences, right? They didn't have the Bible to what Jesus came and taught while he lived and walked among us. How many of you ever heard of a little sermon called the Sermon on the Mount? Have you ever heard of that sermon? Pretty popular sermon given by Jesus himself, which is fully God, fully man. So probably a pretty good sermon, probably one worth listening to. So they were being told all these things, like the Sermon on the Mount, for example, where Jesus taught about many life topics found in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 that we can read about today. So they're being taught. They're, they're linked in. They're, they're Facebook page, social media page, whatever it is, is linked in to encouraging, inspiring things to grow them so they in turn will be a good example as well. They're being influenced in the right way. See, a good role model is someone who is, is a good example to others must first be imitators themselves. So who are they imitating? The second thing we see that leads us to believe that this church is a good example is, is uh, their reception of the message. He wrote, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you become a model to all the believers. You became a model to all the believers. You see, they welcome the message of hope, grace, and joy despite the cultural suicide that would follow. You guys ever found yourself in a place like that? Cultural suicide that may follow if these people find out. 
that I'm a believer? How are they going to respond? Remember we saw in Acts chapter 17 that they were, in, they were in a large city ruled by the Romans with all the idol worship and other worldly beliefs. They could have just as easily rejected the message of hope, grace, and, and joy, but Paul commends them for receiving and standing firm. You think that day is coming for us? But I want to take a minute and just point out how good God is. You see, God knew these believers were in a tough spot. If you're in a tough spot this morning, God knows you're in a tough spot, okay? God knew these believers were in a tough spot. He knew they needed something to help them receive this message and then stand strong to go against the flow of the culture, right? And his answer was the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that this church walks forward with the conviction of joy in their hearts, right? We need the Holy Spirit. It's the same power offered to you and I uh, this morning. This is why we know that God will never leave us or forsake us because he's living in us. We finished a series on this whole topic of the Holy Spirit and how important the Holy Spirit is in us. So he flows through us. They had the Holy Spirit. That's why they were able to make it through. The third thing we see that leads us to believe that this church is a good example is their willingness to share the message. Number of verse eight, the Lord's message rang out. I love that. I just love that word. He didn't say the Lord's message kind of seeped out from, a, from you guys as you were kind of too, you know, going to and fro, it just kind of seeped out. No, Paul says the message rang out. It rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Do you want your faith in God to be known everywhere? So from this small church, the message, it, it rang out. They did not keep quiet about their faith despite the suffering it may cause them. So from this church, a body of believers in a hostile region, the message rang out beyond their simple sphere of influence. It reached their city and region, and now it has even reached the world, even some many, many years later. We're reading about this church to be encouraged, to be inspired, to, to lead, to follow their example. That's great faith, isn't it? The fourth thing we can see that leads us to believe that this church is a good example is this, their service to God. He said, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So this word turn su suggests something, doesn't it? It suggests a conversion, a dramatic shift from, from devotion to idols, from a devotion of worldly possession. It was through this dramatic conversion that they were able to serve God. What is this word in the Bible? What we see here, they turn. It's the word repentance. When we come to God and we give our heart to the Lord and we receive his gift of grace, his gift on the cross, the Bible says we repent. That means we don't stay the same. I don't continue down the same path of living in the world, living in my sin. It means I repent. It means I turn and go the other way. That's what a follower of Christ does. I accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he has to forgive me. I'm not going to change anything. I've heard that throughout the years. To which I say, you will stand before a living God. And I probably would, if I was a betting man willing to bet, you won't say that to him. Jesus said this, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I said this in the first service. Well, Pastor Jay, I don't have a problem with that. I have no money. I have no money, so I can only serve God, but I have no, but here's the question, fill in the blank. You cannot both serve God and what? Is there an idol in your life? Is there something taking more of your time than your, your service to the Lord? It can be television, it could be a gaming system, it could be, none of us have a problem with the little computers in our pocket. 
We don't have any problem with that, right? It could be any of those things. An idol is anything that you put before God. We need to check where we're at. We need to, we need to understand it. Am I spending time with, the God, with God? Am I serving the Lord? Or is this, this idol, this thing, is it taking more priority in my life than it should? You see, and I believe this church realized that if they were going to truly serve God, they had to turn away from the things in life that kept them from serving him. They turned. That's what Paul said. You turn to God. You, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They repented. They turned. They went the way of the Lord. What is in my life that I need to get rid of so I can serve God morally, be more devoted to him? And then fifth, final point this morning of why this church in Thessalonica is a good example for us today is this, their anticipation of Jesus. As I said in the beginning of this, this book a couple of weeks ago, at the, at the end of each chapter, there's five chapters, uh, not necessarily at the end, but each chapter mentions the second coming of Jesus in one way or another. And that's what we see here. Paul writes in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The word wait suggests they were looking for and anticipating his return. Okay? They were looking for and waiting for his return. And I want you to think about this. Well, they wasted their time, Pastor Jay, because Jesus didn't come. They waited. They wasted their time, but they did not waste their time. Where are they now if they're born again disciples of Jesus? They're in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So somehow our spirit, our spirit goes to heaven and we can still be recognized in the spirit. I don't know how that works, but that's what I love about God. You cannot know everything about God. He's a big mystery, right? We can know a lot about him. So they're in heaven and guess what? They're still waiting on, church, with great anticipation. They're waiting for Jesus to come back for the church. Who is the only person in heaven that knows the day of his return? God the Father. Jesus doesn't even know. So they're all waiting in anticipation. Is today the day that Jesus is going to saddle up on that white horse and go down? They must watch him every day. Think about it. Think about it. Is today the day? Is the day today? We're getting ready to get the church, start, start the, the wrath, go into the millennial reign of Christ, have a new heaven, a new earth. They know all that's going to happen, so they are waiting in anticipation for it to happen. They have to be. So there's still surprises. There's still excitement in heaven, isn't there? Don't let people tell you that heaven's going to be a boring place. You go to heaven and sit on your cloud and play your harp. I'm going to hell to party with my friends. There's going to be no party, church. But see, that's, that's what waiting causes, right? Anticipation. Just think back to the, the anticipation you had as a child for your very first day of school to be away from home all day. How many of you remember that, that first day of school? Well, you guys are old. You're telling me not one person in here remembers the first, yeah, okay, thank you. I mean, I'm only 28, but I still remember <laughs> my first day of school. I remember I had a lot of hair. Remember the anticipation you had as you waited to be old enough to drive, to go where you wanted to go? Remember that day? Oh, yeah. You got, you, now, who remembers that day? course. How about the anticipation you had to finally turn 18 and become an adult? Huh? To be on your own, to be the captain of your destination. Nobody's going to tell me what to do anymore. You're 18, you know it all. The older you get, the more you realize you know nothing. <laughs> right? Isn't that the way it works? 
Of course, I wasn't that way when I was 18. If my mom's watching. Anticipation. Just think of, think of those memories you had. Wait, some, some anticip- something in your life where you just had this great anticipation. You see, that's what this church had is they waited for the return of Jesus. They had anticipation. Something great is going to happen. And they still have anticipation in heaven. Something great is going to happen. And they know what's going to happen. They're just waiting for that day to happen. And as I said, I, I can't wait for that day to happen. The only, the only thing that keeps me at any kind of reserved at any kind of point at all and waiting for, I'm ready for Jesus to come. I'm ready to go home. The only thing that breaks my heart, I still have friends and family that need to know the Lord. So that, that puts the brakes on a little bit for me. But other than that, I'm ready. Anybody else ready? I'm ready. No more hurt back. No more uh, pain and suffering. Just think about it. I'm ready. And the way it's going to happen, which we'll get into in a few weeks, my, oh, my. Hollywood's got nothing on this. See, a church like this gives us a great example as they put their hope, their anticipation in his return. They're going through some rough stuff. They're an early church, but they're anticipating his return. They're being mocked. They're being ridiculed. By the way, the Bible says that's going to get worse and worse. As his day approaches, many will fall away from the faith, but we are to hold fast. His return is nigh. He will come at some day when nobody expects it. So those are the five examples we can learn from this church. But I want us to end with a few personal questions designed to challenge each of us to reflect where we stand in each of these five points we discussed. So there's quickly, we're going to do these five because there has to be a challenge. We can look at this. We can understand that this church is a great example. We can, we can strive to say, we're going to imitate their great example, make them a role model, put Jesus first. But, but the thing is, is we got to put it into action, right? We have to, we have to think about how we are going to respond, not only as a church, but individual as individuals. So the first question I would have for you is, who is your role model? If you're on social media, maybe there's some people you follow that you shouldn't be following and then you should let the Holy Spirit speak to you and maybe you should take care of that. What interest do you have What interest do you have in life that causes you to elevate someone to strive or to be like First of all I hope it's the Lord Jesus first If you're not sure who Jesus is I recommend you read the four gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John Read about Jesus that's who you want to be like Any others in your life that you may choose to elevate for whatever reason, I hope and pray they have put Jesus first as well. Second thing, have you received the message? And the message is this. The message is this. God created men and women in his image to live in fellowship with him. But mankind chose to disobey God to sin. We were separated from God because he knows no sin. So he sent his son to live with us, to to be our role model, to imitate him in word and deed. He then died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. The message is forgiveness, grace, hope, and love, just to name a few. Have you received that message? You can receive it. You just have to choose to receive it. Number three, are you willing to share this message? So once you receive this life-changing message, this life-changing message, not only will you be transformed as you walk with Jesus to be like Jesus, to imitate Jesus, things change in your life. Your, your life here will change if you're serious about your walk with God. So not only 
Will it change you here? It will change you for eternity. Once you receive this life-changing message, I pray you are ready to share it with others. You're all evangelists. You are. You're all evangelists. Oh, I don't know, Pastor Jay. You're all evangelists. You may never stand before a large audience and speak, but you will stand before your friends. You will stand before your family. You will stand before your coworkers. Be willing to share the hope that is in you to the world that has very little hope without Jesus. That's what we're seeing today. And by the way, while you're sharing this message of hope, sometimes use your words. Your actions will draw people to ask questions. Then you can use your words. What do they see? Number four, are you willing to serve God? Have you unintentionally put an idol before your relationship with God? To serve him is to put him first in all areas of your life. As you do that, the floodgates will open with many, many opportunities to serve him. I pause there for a reason. Does the Spirit speak to you about something that's in your life that you put before Him right there? I pray He did. I pray you have a good long talk with Him about it. God wants to be first. You can have all those things. You can do all those things. There's nothing wrong with them, but just don't put God down the list of things. Number five, do you have an anticipation for the return of Jesus? I like the way Paul said, eagerly. Do you eagerly await his return? Does his return excite you? Think about it. Does his return excite you or perhaps does it frighten you? It should excite you. I truly believe we are living in one of the most exciting times the world has ever seen throughout its history. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? How many of you think that may be a little crazy? What do you mean, Pastor Jay, the most exciting time throughout the... Were you awake last year? What? Did you you see what happened? What most exciting times in the spiritual realm, yes, the most exciting times in the history of mankind lay before us. You see, it's very, very possible as we watch current events happening throughout the world in light of what the Bible says about the second coming of Jesus, it is very, very possible that we could see his return in our lifetime. Things are unfolding. Things are happening. Scripture is coming to pass. The things that uh, the generation like my grandparents couldn't understand, like like uh, the mark of the beast, like how are we going to all be marked? Uh, or how about how, how can everybody see Jesus around the world? H- have you ever heard of satellite TV? H- have you ever gone to the store and scanned something to purchase and how they're talking about how they can easily do that with each and every one of us? You see, technology is catching up to prophecy. And we're seeing those things begin to happen. It's like, it's like, wow, this, this actually might be true. And yes, there may be an element of fear behind it all. But I'll tell you what, to actually be part of the world history, all the history of mankind that God created to actually be the generation that could be alive and see him and be taken up into clouds with him. You can't tell me that that would not be pretty awesome. Yeah, it would be overwhelming, but don't worry. You won't be overwhelmed too long because it's going to happen like that. Boom, gone, up, 
out. See you in the air. We'll talk more about that in the weeks to come when we get to that chapter. This is why it's more important than ever that we live a life for the world to see a church worth imitating and people walking out their faith in a world that needs hope. The world needs hope right now. They don't need more government programs, more government bailouts. They don't need this or that. They need hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings joy. He brings hope. He brings peace. He is the only one that will set you free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. I used to be a very fearful, paranoid person before I came to know the Lord. I guarantee you, if I was the same person I was before Jesus came and last year happened, I don't know how I would have made it. I'd probably be in a bunker up in the hills still today. Nobody around. I was super, super paranoid. But I came to know Jesus. He took that all away. See, but that's what Jesus does. And the world needs that kind of hope. As we close, I want to ask you to remember that this church in Thessalonica was very young in their faith journey. Even so, Paul was able to write and speak about them with great encouraging words. It demonstrates to each of us what can happen when people totally give themselves to Jesus, when they seek to imitate Jesus and his disciples. If you are a born-again believer, you are a disciple of Jesus. When they receive the message despite what their cultural may do or say, I don't care if you think I'm a Jesus freak. I love Jesus. I don't care if it goes against the grain. I don't care because I believe in Jesus. I know who I was and I know what Jesus is doing to change my life. I'm a much better person than I follow him. So I don't care. Are you ready to tell the world that? Are we willing to go and share the message of hope? Are we willing to forsake the things of this world and serve God? And do we really truly eagerly wait for his return. And once again, if, if, if you don't get to see it here, for some reason the Lord takes you home, you still get to eagerly wait for his return. It still gets to happen. Right? You're just going to see it on the other side. You're going to see him saddle up. We're not going to see all that. You get to, oh yeah, here we go, here we go, let's go, get behind him, it's time, it's time. You know, you're going to at least get to see a little bit before we do. I'm going to leave you with this last statement. Are we a church worthy of imitating and are you a disciple worthy of imitating? That's what it comes down to today. As we look at this example of this church, as we dive into chapter 2 next week. Where are you? Are there idols in your life that you're putting before the Lord? What is going on in your life? Can you be an influencer? Can you help shape a character? Where, where, where are you? Is the world shaping you or are you shaping the world? Father, I thank you for your precious people. I thank you that we can turn to the living, breathing word of God. I thank you, God that you have not left us as orphans wondering, well, how, how do we act? What do we do? What do we say? You came and you lived a life. You gave us an example. We have others before us. We have the apostles, disciples. We have other churches we can read about and how they gave us examples as well. And God, may we strive to be good examples, to be good role models, Lord, to see how we're imitating those things as well. Put that on our hearts and our minds, Lord. May your spirit just speak clearly to each and every one of us in the days ahead. And Father, one more time, I don't know what's going on with our brother, but Lord Jesus, we lift him up. We agree in prayer right now, God, that there's going to be a good report, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You, you don't have to run off. You want coffee, fellowship, one with another. If, another, if you need prayer, please come down and we'll pray with you. God bless.